Well, here we are with uh, two of the fathers of neonatal medicine and pediatric radiology. It's really my tremendous honor to be with you, Dr. William Northway, and with you, Dr. Philip Sunshine, here today to talk a little bit about how we came to be here today in this room to talk about bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Thank, thank you both so much for sharing this time with me. So, and so you, Dr. Northway, were reading films. Correct. And you were looking at these babies. T tell me a little bit about what you saw and the environment that allowed you to come up with your notions surrounding lung disease in these infants. Well, it was really important that these infants survive, and they were working very hard uh, to ventilate them, and that was new. And they were working very hard to figure out what amount of oxygen to use because it became clear, and I did some experiments in newborn mice, that 100% oxygen could really badly affect the lung. So what did you see in these x-rays, and how did you correlate that with what, you, what people were seeing in the clinical setting? Well, in the x-rays, I saw that the infants were actually being ventilated and that their lungs were expanding, but I also began to see changes in the lungs which were disturbing in the sense that there were some infiltrates, little, little changes in the lung. And then uh, as it went on, they became, lungs were becoming stiffer. And uh, it was a very difficult but exciting time, but it was very hard. Is that well, they, and he really described the cystic changes. It went from correct the high lung membrane issues, the respiratory distress syndrome, and then infiltrates, and then these later stages were the severe cystic changes. Right, yeah. and that was new, and we hadn't seen them before, and it was very worse. And right. you have to realize when we ventilated babies, we didn't have a Veriflow Correct. to say how much oxygen. We had a choice of user, 100% oxygen, 40%, or room air. Right. We knew when to put babies on, but then when the babies are ready to be weaned from the ventilator, that was difficult. How do you tell this baby's going to be able to make it? So, Bill, a lot of people would argue, as I've said before, that the one of the greatest strengths of that paper was the correlation between the clinical presentation, the radiology, correla radiology pictures, and the uh, actual pathology that was noted. Okay. How was it that you were so confident of the clinical presentations and the clinical situation that you encountered? Did you, did you actually go see the patients? Oh, yeah. I'm Phil knows. I went up and I'd look at them and I'd look at the x-ray and I'd look at the patient and I'd talk to the people that were taking care of them. And they were all, we were all on the cutting edge. I mean, right, this was not being done. I mean, that's not fair. It was being done other places, but just starting. And we were all concerned. We all wanted the kids to do well for themselves and the parents and so forth. But, you know, it's cutting edge. And when you're on the cutting edge, good things happen and other things happen. So Yeah, but he's one of the few radiologists who would actually come and examine the babies. That yeah, so he was so that's, my, that's my real, the crux no. of the question I had. So you made sure that that clinical description fit with your clinical examination. Absolutely. Well, and I was working, to, go ahead. He used to pick up things that we missed. The, the classic example was a patient with neurofibromatosis. This was a, actually on the pediatric wards uh, that had nodules along the peripheral nerves that we all missed, and Bill examined the patient and picked this up and discussed it at a conference. And I remember one of our faculty asked, why are you examining our patient? <laughs> so tell me uh, a little bit about the, the paper itself. It came out in 67. Right. And um, why did you choose to publish it, for example, in New England Journal? Good question. I wasn't going to publish it in the New England Journal. I was going to publish it in a radiology journal, like radiology. And so I took it to my uh, division uh, diagnostic radiology chairman, Herb Abrams, Dr. Herb Abrams, who became famous later for his work in cardiovascular uh, imaging. And I said, I'd like to publish this in radiology, which is a very good radiology journal. And he took one look at it and said, no, it's too important. We're gonna publish it to the New England Journal of Medicine. I said. 
they'll never accept it from a junior faculty in radiology. And, and he said, oh, they'll accept this one. He went over and he was an English major as well as a physician radiologist. So he went over it. So it was, it was, he improved my writing. It was beautifully written with him as help, thank God. We went over all the numbers in the paper, you know, the, the, the laboratory numbers, and we sent it in. And it, as I recall, it was initially, they sent it back, uh, not that they rejected it, they sent it back, but they had questions about this number and that number and that sort of thing. So we had it all gone over again, sent it back to them, and they published it. So, but how about once it got published, Dr. Northway, did you get a lot of reaction? Was there reaction oh, yeah. within the institution? I got, I got, I got a lot of reaction in, in a variety of ways. Some people said, uh, editorially wise, we never see this. Fair enough, remember that? They were saying that. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, I was, just, I was upset that they weren't seeing it. I was glad they weren't seeing it. So I would go back east and speak to them in Boston or, Mass or, or wherever it was, Virginia, and say, okay, now let's, I came back to see what you're doing that we're not doing so we can improve, because I wanted to be positive for them. Well, then when I got in the small meetings with them, they were saying, ex seeing exactly what we saw. The, the paper had three authors on it, yes. a pediatric radiologist. Correct. And two pediatric pathologists. Correct. And um, yet it came from the Department of Pediatrics as well. Right. Why weren't there any pediatricians on the paper? That's a very sore point. And the yeah. problem was is that uh, the person who was directing our nursery felt that it was a black mark at Stanford. And I had invited all the pediatricians I worked with to be co-authors, including Phil. Every single one I worked with, I said, join me on this. And many of them wanted to do it, but the chief didn't feel that that was, he felt it was a black mark on him. So we felt that if he felt that way and didn't want his name on the paper, yep. rather than blocking it, we just said, don't put any of our names on it. So, so do, you, do you guys think that uh, this idea of reporting less than perfect outcomes uh, was a helpful thing to do? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. No question about it. It changed care. Yeah. That's fair. It and really changed care. Let, let me just uh, ask you a, a question about the paper as well. <clears throat> there were 49 references in the paper, uh, and um, 48 of them were to other articles. One was you referenced a personal communication with several of the pediatricians, uh, including Phil Sunshine. Um, how many of those references do you think you actually read uh, in preparation for writing that manuscript? Oh, I'd read all of them. You'd read all oh, of yeah, the references? Oh, yeah, I don't put a reference down that I haven't read. Uh-huh. No, they're all read. <laughs> and, and, no, yeah, no, I don't just say, oh, and so-and-so said. No, I, I would go read it. So if they're there, they, they, they played a role. You have to realize he's one of the true investigators. Even though there were some of his patients, especially when he was doing the work with the mice that didn't quite fit the protocol, <laughs> rather than throwing those out, he included all of these. So uh, whenever Bill wrote a paper, you knew that all the data were there, everything that he wrote was well documented, and he was a true scientist. I never thought I'd say that about a radiologist, <laughs> but <laughs> that's the truth. How much do you think sort of the, the context uh, being in that place, in that environment, with these sorts of people in a nursery that was arguably a human biology laboratory changed the way that you thought about these problems? Well, the, the care of the babies changed tremendously during this period of time. Yes. Intravenous nutrition came into play. We were fortunate uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, serendipity, uh, we had one ventilator that had a sticky valve. It was one of the old Bennett PR2s. Yeah, Bennett PR2s. And we noticed that babies who were on this ventilator did better. Then we realized that we had an inspiratory time. Prior to that time, the ventilator would work. You'd get a pressure, come down. This time we had a little inspiratory time. 
And it also, it had inadvertent peep, which we couldn't measure on the dial. Positive expired yeah. yeah. But uh, so that improved our outcome with the survival rate of somewhere in the 40s yeah. all the way up over 60%. Yeah, it, was, it was big. So what about this name, bronchopulmonary dysplasia? Where, where did that come from? Well, I looked at what was going on and the, what, what the changes that were happening affected the airways, the bronchi, the lungs, pulmonary, and it was a dysplasia. It was in a growing, immature lung, and it changed the way the lung went. So we called it bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It turned out BPD became common, I mean, you know, commonly known, but I didn't know it at the time. Some people recommended we call bronchoalveolar dysplasia. Yeah. But that would have been bad. But BPD sounds so much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would have been bad. That's right? right. It would have been bad, yeah. <laughs> so what do you want to tell uh, physician scientists today? You know, when you see something wrong and you think you might have a way to make it better, get things back to where you'd like them to be, you, ha you want to pursue it. And pursuing it has it, gotten more difficult, but it's still worth doing because you may be able to really change somebody's life. Your, the problem that you originally described has largely been ameliorated. Ameliorated, right. And now we have, we've pushed back the frontiers and we're standing on the shoulders of giants and now looking at a new manifestation of neonatal lung disease. So knowing what you have uh, done in terms of really making therapy pretty straightforward for a 33, 32, 34 week baby, which when Phil was starting out, that was a dicey proposition. Well, the babies. big thing is that if you were 28 weeks or below, mm -hmm. you had less than a 10% chance of surviving. Correct. Uh, now, if you're at 28 weeks, you know, you have about a 90% chance of survival. Yeah, it's really changed. As we are pushing back the frontier, a lot of us are very nervous about how far back we can go. Mm -hmm. We know we can have these babies survive, but we don't know how they're going to survive, what kind of handicaps they will have. Right. On behalf of uh, pediatric pulmonologists, neonatologists, pediatricians, cardiologists, parents, children everywhere, uh, I want to really thank you both sincerely and profoundly for everything you've done uh, for the field, uh, for all of the children uh, for so many years. We, we truly do stand on the shoulders of giants, and uh, thank you for that privilege. Well, it's our pleasure. Thank you. He's the giant. <laughs>